Hi Kelly. Okay. I'm just checking with you. Have you ever deal with fake and toxic people in the marketplace? Because God has actually sent us his chips among the holes, right? In the marketplace. Have you ever deal with fake and toxic people? Like people who steal your ideas and then claim credit for for it. Yeah. Well, are you specifically referring to people who steal your ideas and claim credit for it? Okay. Well. Being the pioneer of the online business, blog shop back then and right now e-commerce in Singapore, I think, yes, there were a lot of like people who did what we did in a sense down to the point of copying our designs and, and stealing our designs and passing off as theirs. I think that is something that is really frustrating. But I guess in my experience, it is something that I cannot control. Um, it is something that I just have to find a way to just direct and refocus my attention on. So like I always say, specifically to that question about stealing designs and stuff like that, I always tell myself, you know, our competitors can copy our designs, steal our marketing campaigns, emulate the exact way our website looks. It's like no effort, you know, on their part. And But I just say, if there's one thing that they cannot take away, it is really the soul, the heart and soul of the Bonito. And that is a truly loving, caring for our customers. And that is something that they cannot take away, the customer experience that we give to our customers, um, the initiatives that are born out of our love and understanding of our customers. So yes, I'm sure that all of us will, 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 will experience it in different ways, but it just sounds like yours seems very personal. And, and I guess for me, yeah, don't focus on it. And just, just yeah, focus on what you want to do. I hope that's okay. Yeah. It's hard. <laughs> but that's what happens. I get to see them in marketplace. You talk about like in the same scene and stuff like that. Tech in Asia? Or tech in Asia events. Mm, just be cordial. Like for me, whenever I see my competitors, I wouldn't roll my eyes, I would control my eyeballs. <laughs> uh, I, I mean competitors who have really just copied us and, and just like, be gracious. I mean, ultimately, I always remind myself that you are a vessel of God and you are an example of a Christian leader. And you know, don't portray yourself as how God wouldn't portray himself. Oh, okay, so there's so many times where I feel so much injustice, right? There was a time I really went to Google, how does God deal with injustice? It's like there was, I Google so many times, Bible verses for when you are dealing with injustice. And so many times I can say the whole thing, but anyways, my point is that if there's anyone who has gone through it and more, it is Jesus. And of course, you know, Easter reminded me again that he was the one was crucified, he died on the cross, he was accused, he was betrayed by his closest disciple for nothing wrong that he had done. So I always tell myself, God, if you have borne all of this, you know, surely this is just a fraction of what you you went through. I just have to deal with it and you just have to ask for God's grace. It is very hard, especially at night. It comes to you at night. The thief comes to steal, kill and destroy at night. It's really true. So all my Google searches are always at night about how to deal with injustice. What does God say about injustice? What to say to your enemies when you feel injustice? So trust me, think about Jesus and what he went through and you will feel better. It just really, he will give you the grace. Don't focus on it. Yeah. The Bible says, love your enemies. That's Next question. Hi, Amy. Um, I just wanted to check how do you put forth your faith um, in line with your business, especially with non-Christians? Because, I mean, sometimes non-Christians might find it very difficult to... You know, in my, in my yeah, yeah, office? Yeah, yeah. In my organization? Yeah. Okay. How do, do I... find it difficult to do work with non-Christians? In terms of putting forth your ideas, your faith, no, no, no. Because it's, it's, it's not. It's not a. It is not like a Christ, It is not a Christian Bible church business. In a sense, where what we do is still. I mean, 
selling clothes in the world, helping women, blah, blah, blah. So it's not like I always have to come in, okay, guys, based on this verse, we are going to do this. <laughs> So, I mean, like, whatever that we do, it is still a business that is of the marketplace. So, for me, I think, back to your question about is it hard to work with non-Christians, I think it's all down to the interview process. I have met amazing non-Christians with some of them even better values than Christians that I know of. And stuff like that. I'm sure we know of people like that. So, it's really not about Christians or non-Christians. And of course, on the, high, on, on the other hand, I've had the benefits of working with strong Great, amazing Christians with some of the best attitudes who are also like here today with me. So yeah, it's really not about Christians or non-Christians, but rather the attitude and the values that you see. Mm, I hope that helps. Hi, my name is Bridget. I'm actually in the retail uh, ladies' clothes for many years. So you're my competitor. I'm from the I'm old. I'm coming, coming out. Okay. I'm from the old economy where I really run a you know a real retail shop. Um, the Lord has uh, given me this business, and actually the vision is also the same as yours. Actually, it's in Proverbs 31 where God wants me to clothe women with strength and dignity, it's empowering women so that they feel uh, confident and yeah, la, you know a lot of women are very uh, insecure. So uh, anyway, what I'm sharing this is also I'm asking you, uh, you have, uh, I mean you've reached a level of success, so have you thought about uh, like um, another avenue where you may want to like uh, give back to God in a different way like for example empowering uh, women in the those uh, disadvantaged uh, places uh. what i'm asking actually is uh, are you interested in social enterprise all this i'm not starting anything i'm just this is one of my passion so i'm wondering whether there's anything like that from your end and if you are um, i would like to know more about it yeah so basically um in this journey of discovering about myself, uh, one of the things which I didn't share is that I've learned that I am a really relatable person. I'm a relatable girl. You know, for the longest time, for the longest time, I've always wanted to be aspirational, inspirational. You know, but one day, one of my close friends, Pixies, Shireen, and she came up to me and she said, "Rich, you're relatable. Accept it." I said, what do you mean I'm relatable? You're not inspirational, aspirational, you're relatable. And I thought, okay, I felt a bit hurt, but I was like, okay, maybe God, you will tell me what it really means. And so I, I, I went back and I just pondered upon it. And then once again, God started to show me how because of my relatability, women are able to open up to me. Like, just women on the streets, like, Customers, women like you and me are just able to open up to me, to talk about their problems, to share with me and to ask me questions. And so I realized, wow, God, use my relatability then, you know, to, 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 to bless and influence the people around. And so actually, I started a group, a, a, a women's group within my own capacity. You know, there was a time where there was quite a number of women who were writing into me, young and mature women were writing in to me and to ask me stuff about life, marriage, personal work, career, entrepreneurship, business. And there was this period last April, it got overwhelming and I thought, okay, why don't I just gather all of you, just, just come together, have a picnic session at Botanical Gardens and we'll just talk about anything that you want to ask me. And so there were about 12 women who came, uh, they are invited and we sat down and have a, we had a picnic and so none of them knew each other neither did I know any of them but it was then that we bonded we shared, we talked about problems I opened up about my struggles my mistakes, my failures and I realised that this is something that God can use me and is using me to help those around and the group has since grown 
and I told God that I must be committed to make this you know, work for your glory because there are so many lives and there are Christians and non-Christians alike that I feel that, you know, women today, the young women, they don't really have anyone to turn to. And so actually I asked some of them, actually for the problem, do you talk to your friends about it, your good friends, your inner circle? And they will tell me, no, because actually sometimes they are the ones I'm having problems with. <laughs> it's so sad, now we can laugh, you know, but it's, it's really sad and I thought, Okay, then if I can be that, you know, to just help you, share with you my experiences and to hopefully direct you to God, then, then that shall be it. So, yeah. Yes, I'm definitely interested to just doing beyond the Ponito and just using my gifts and abilities to help people. Hi uh, Rachel, uh, my name is Tony. Thank you for sharing your amazing journey with us. Um, I'm probably going to be the only guy asking you a question. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to ask this on behalf of all the men. When are you going to start a men's line? You know, I get this question all the time. And when, when we were still known as bonitochico.livejournal.com and then one day Daniel Ong, the host, he was hosting one of our uh, annual parties, not parties, but I mean like annual gathering celebration. And so one of the questions was, uh, when are we going to start a men's night? And just then just say, oh yeah, you know, I have a great idea because we were known as Bonito Chico back then. And he said, if you want to start a men's night, you can call it Bonito Chico Bay. <laughs> Anyways, that was just a funny joke. But anyways, when am I going to start a men's line? I don't know, probably not in my lifetime. I always believe that when you start something, you must be passionate about it. And to be very honest, I'm not passionate about men. Stop, clothes. Um, I don't know much about them and their shopping habits. All I know is that you guys are difficult. You are more stingy with your money than women. It's harder to earn the men's money. I think women are the ones that are driving the economy, right? So anyways, you guys are picky, you know? Like, uh, you don't shop as often as women. It's not so easy to... Well, to get us to part with <laughs> Yeah, to get you to part with your money is a very nice way of saying it. So, yeah, and, and, and my, my, my answer is back to because I am not interested in men's life and, and I'm not going to start it just because there is a lack in the market and I'm not going to start it just because it might be a good idea. I think when we start a business, you truly have to be interested and genuinely passionate about it for you to create a great business. So, so sorry about that. <laughs> Hi Rachel, my name is Eileen. Thank Hi. you for sharing today. Uh, I'm a little bit curious about um, the time when you first started your business in university till the time you realised um, what it was meant for a greater purpose which you shared when you met that lady. So could you share with us a little bit about that journey because um, that seemed like the time when maybe it was not truly clear or was it clear to you that it was God's purpose for you to start this business? Well, th th this is a really good question. Um, so she was asking me, you know, like from the time when I started my business, I dropped out of school, was in huge debt with my mom, you know, to start the business to when God showed me through Rebecca, her story, you know, the, the one who had to go through major surgeries. Um, did I know that God was leading me into this? To be honest, no. But God was really showing me and helping me discover my interests, my passions. God was really showing me that I love to be a salesperson. I love to talk to women. In fact, before I, after my O levels, I started to work in City Plaza back then, you know, and I was a sales girl, selling clothes, wholesale. And I used to dread that job because like, oh my god, I have to wake up so early and I don't know what will it benefit me for. But it was back then that I picked up key skills, you know, with regards to wholesaling, manufacturing, selling of clothes, talking to customers, talking to your suppliers. And I didn't know until now when I look back. 
And after that job, I was a waitress as well. And so I, I learned to serve people. I learned to attend to nasty customers. I learned to smile in the midst of the nastiest customers. So it's little lessons like that on hindsight that I realized God was preparing me for. So to be very honest, when I, when I, what drove me to, to drop out of school to start the business was not because I heard clearly from God. Maybe it was also because that I wasn't very in tune with God then. But the main thing that drove me was that because I was still young then. And I thought, you know, if the business fails, there's no way that I can... Okay, wait. If the business fails, I can always go back to studying. You know, I will not lose much. But if I didn't try, I will always wonder and, you know, what could it have been if I had tried? What could it have been if I had, you know, just taken the leap of faith? So that being said, I must say that my mom took an entire week to fast and pray about her decision to pour her whole life savings to me to start the business. So maybe she should be the one answering the question. Yeah. It's true. So maybe she heard from God. I don't know. She hasn't told me, but yeah. Because it's a huge step. Yeah, so I didn't know, not at all, but I knew that God was showing me my interests, my passions, and my strengths, and my weaknesses. Yeah. Hello. Oh, sorry. Should I continue? Of course, you have the mic. <laughs> You're powerful. Um, my name is Stephanie. Yes. Um, I also kind of recently started my own business. But one thing that I struggle with right now, I think the most is time management and really how to juggle all the different aspects in life. Recently, I, I read an article that talks about, it's a four burner theory, I don't know if you heard it, but the first burner represents your family, the second burner is your friends, the third burner is your health, the fourth burner What's is your burner? Home. Like in an what oven. Oh, B-U-R-N-E-R. So the theory says that in order to be successful, you have to cut off one of the burners, and if you want to be very successful, you have to cut off two. Um, I mean, I know in a Christian perspective, God is driving all of that, um, but still as a Christian, I struggle on really how do you prioritize different things, and how do you make time for relationships especially. So what are the four burners? Family. Oh, sorry. Fan. Wait, I also need to refer. Okay. <laughs> Family, friends, health, and work. Wow. Okay. They're huge. For me, well, time management admittedly is not something I'm best at. But I have learned that we can't have it all. We really can't. And it's really about prioritizing. And if you have more than three priorities, you are not prioritizing anything at all. So it's really about, you know, sacrifice. I truly believe that something has to give, but not in a sense where you neglect completely. So it's really about what's important to you. And for me, you know, like I said, I shared earlier, my family, they are really my source of strength. And, 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 and maybe God made it easier in a sense for me by sending my two brothers overseas. My younger brother is in um, Sheffield studying law. My older brother is in missions in Chiang Rai. And so I don't get to see them so often. But I mean, we talk a lot. And, and I guess, in a sense, I can spend my weekend with my parents, my friends, you know, and I just have to catch up with them over text. FaceTime calls and I am very thankful for my husband because he is an introvert. <laughs> I want to say he's very understanding but actually it's because he's an introvert and that's why he gives me a lot of time to myself to do what I really love to do which is like share with you, help women, uh, have women group sessions on Saturdays. Yeah and so I always thank him. I say honey thank you so much for letting me do what I want to do. No problem. It's like, go please do more of it. It's like enjoying his alone time. But anyways, so I guess for me, um, I always know that family is really important to me. Relationships. I am a relational person. And I cannot, I cannot do anything without my family. Because to me, they are reminders of God's love and promises. And so, I spend a lot of time with them. And I just have to prioritize. I realize that when you have no choice and you have limited time and we have so much to do, it forces us to be efficient and productive. And we are actually much more capable in that area than we think that we are. So I guess it's just prioritizing and squeezing in and being disciplined. Like work out, I try to do it in the morning and get it out of the way. Yeah, try is the keyword.
Yes. Hi, Rachel. Hi. This is Samson. Hi, Samson. I guess I'm the second guy going to ask you questions. Okay. Well, I'm not going to ask you about men's clothing. So. <laughs> For me, it's, I, I, I work in a startup, mm. and for me, it's, I find it very hard when, when the company is like a few guys, turn up to 30 to 50 people, you constantly, every minute, you have to make decisions. It can be all kinds of decisions. What position are you in, may I ask? I'm, I'm actually uh, running the whole company. Okay. Right? So for me, it's, when you make decisions, you're based on certain principles. Mm. I, and I truly really believe that you are a leader in the organization. What are the values and principles that you hold forth that help you to make decisions on the day to day, especially when you want to scale the company? This right? is so deep. And, and I, I find this is really difficult. It is so difficult. I can feel your pain. Just through your sharing. I, I just had a very painful session this afternoon. Okay. So, so this is a good time. So I just want to hear how you see things, what is your perspective, your values. Oh. This is a leadership conference, right? <laughs> Thank you. Is this a conference, Linda, that I don't know about? <laughs> okay, wait. So what's the question? You want to ask me what what do you principles and your, your key principles in running that organizations in terms of your people, your your, your, your the, the whole the whole thing. Okay, it's really a very deep question, and I must say that I I. It, it, I think it takes a lot of time for me to answer that, but in a nutshell, in a very, very nutshell, in a very small nutshell. Um, firstly, I think as a leader of the organization, you must know what your values are, your personal values are. And it was only something that I started to sit down, be intentional, reflect and think about. Really what my values are, what's important to me. And at the end of the day, like I say, what does success mean to me as a business owner and as a business leader? Because from that definition of success drives every decision that you make. And like I said earlier, that to me, the success of Learn Bonito is not that at the end of the day, we hit a billion dollars. Well, that is great. You know, I'm not going to achieve that at all costs by sacrificing my values, by sacrificing my people. I think at the end of the day, success to me in Love Bonito is in the lives that I and the brand have touched in terms of the customers and even the people who work with us. And so, like, I would sacrifice certain things that might not make sense to people, like certain profit-making decisions just so that I can take the longer and windier road to keep the integrity of my business, the brand integrity. And trust me, I know what it means when it's so hard sometimes where, you know, in business today, it's so cutthroat. Um, it's either you do or you die. The investors are always hounding you to hit the margin, to hit your whatever. I guess for me at the end of the day, and money is important. But it is not the reason your business exists. I always tell myself that money is like oxygen. It's like the air that we breathe. It's like the food that we eat. It is for sustenance. But money is not the purpose of our existence. Our purpose, the purpose is beyond that. It's greater than that. And you just have to find that. Because when you find that, then everything that trickles down suddenly becomes slightly clearer. And that being said, it requires a lot of discipline, you know, to to take the longer and wider road, to choose, to make a decision that you can sleep better at night. You might be very stressed, but at least you know in your heart that you are accountable to God and you can face Him. It's very hard, trust me. I've been there many times and we've even had fights in office, you know, and like disagreements and it's like, yeah, but at the end of the day, you must make it very clear. And like I said earlier, to me, the customers are not just like 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. They are really lives that we value. So I hope it's not like easier said than done, but I've been through it. And yeah, you just need to work out your values and what's important to you and the purpose, and then it will trickle down. Hmm. I think the key stakeholders need to be on the same page when it comes to values in the business, otherwise 
you're gonna have this struggle all the time, you know. So, so who you choose as your partners, who you choose as your key stakeholders, I think has to reflect the same values as well. And, and that's a critical process you need to take, otherwise you'll be fighting all the time. Yes, it's Sorry. true. If I may share very quickly. Uh, so, for the longest time, there have been like many people who wanted to invest in the Bonito. Um, we talk about um, VCs or you know angel investors or just random people on the street who will write to us and tell us they want to put money with us. But I think for us, we took a whole two years to interview and talk to different kinds of VCs and different kinds of potential investors to make sure that they would understand that we are not a brand or a company who would at all costs, do anything just to hit our top line revenue. And that's not something that anyone can accept. So thank God, finally, after two years, we found someone who could accept that. And beyond that, yeah, could really believe and stand, in it, stand with us on that. So it's really very important. Yeah, it's like a marriage. Mm -hmm. Hi, Rachel. My name is Phyllis. So just want to ask you, while you embrace your strengths, how do you deal with your weaknesses since nobody is perfect? Like, do you feel inferior about those weaknesses that you have? Yes. This is so happy, the session. I hope you guys are still okay. Uh, well, I embrace my strengths. I actually also mean I embrace my weaknesses. And, and I have a lot of weaknesses. So I think for me, it's in firstly knowing, discovering. Let's talk about weaknesses, strengths aside. It's really in knowing and discovering who you are and who you're not. And that is so important. I learned from the beginning that I am not a whole list of things. I'm not detailed, I'm bad at following through, um, I am disorganized and stuff like that. So for me, firstly, of course, it's not to say that, okay, I'm also very, very bad with numbers. And not to say that I'm just going to completely neglect these areas and not work on them. But what I've come to terms with is that I will never be great in those areas. But if I were to focus my, my time and energy on my strengths, things that I'm naturally good at, I could possibly be a 10 out of 10 in, the, in those areas. But if I were to focus the same amount of energy and time and my weaknesses, I think at best I'll be like a 2 out of 10. You know, and we, we don't want to be there. I think the world reminds us enough of how lousy we are, how inadequate we are, how insufficient that we are. But I think for me, it's in surrounding yourself intentionally with people who will complement your weaknesses. So if you look at my team, the closest people to me are the ones who are completely brutally honest. Um, they are the ones who are detailed, they can follow through, they are analytical because these are what I am not. And I need the brutally honest side of them to tell me off on certain things certain times or to just wake me up and tell me, hey, what, what, what are you doing this for and stuff like that. So I guess for me, knowing my weaknesses and embracing it comes in terms of just, yeah, surrounding myself with people who can help me in those areas. And of course, like, I have to work on it also. I realize that I'm not a very logical person, if you know what I mean. It's very hard for me to be logical, to think logically, because I'm so much of a dreamer. And so I'm actually taking lessons to really train my mind to be logical. And these are things that, yes, although they are my weaknesses, I don't completely give an excuse for them and neglect them. I think it's also just balancing. I hope that helps. But surrounding yourself with people who can complement your weaknesses is key. It's really key. Yeah. Like I, I knew from the beginning that I'm not good with numbers. And if I were to really spend my whole time trying to balance the shit, forget it, you know? So I decided why don't I just hire an accountant and I just focus on what I'm good at, which is interacting with my customers, getting to know them, coming up with initiatives for them and stuff like that. So yeah, don't beat yourself up too much. Hi, uh, Rachel. My name is Cheryl. <coughs> this session is uh, ready. So I just, yeah, I don't want adding, adding depth to it. <laughs> no, 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 no. I just want to ask you is uh, Love Bonito um, your favorite brand? <laughs> it, it's like majority of a wardrobe that I feel with Love Bonito's clothes. Of course! Oh. Is the camera still rolling? <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, I do have my favorites. I mean, 
I, I do have my favorite. Sunny very cheap then now like the Yeah, Sunny <laughs> my brain cannot get used to like is this frivolous stuff? Okay, but yeah, I mean I do have a lot of favorite brands whom I really admire for their branding, their creativity, for their brand essence, for the way they carry the brand. I think these are like yeah, certain things that I really admire. Like Nike, their messaging, you know, and like cost, Zara. I think they're amazing brands that amazing supply chain, so many things that I can learn from. But yeah. Le Bonito, I try to make it my favorite brand by, you know, really just investing and making it to be the best version of itself. So yes. Uh, one more question. Uh, who like inspires you the most? Wow, who inspires me the most? So deep suddenly. Yeah, suddenly. Um, <laughs> my mother. My mother inspires me the most because I think to just cut the long story short, I came from a uh, well to do family, you know, and in the 1997 crisis, like Victor mentioned earlier, my father became bankrupt. And I had to move from a big terrace house to like, not even a one-room home, just a one-room. We had to squeeze, all of us had to squeeze in one room. And during that period, even during then, my mom had to deal with a lot of um, betrayal, a lot of struggle with her marriage with my dad. So. Seeing my mom go through all of that, single-handedly from being a homemaker, Tai Tai, to having to work three jobs at one go, three jobs, you know, and to just sacrificing so much of herself just so that her children can have food on the table. The tenacity, the strength that she showed really, really, really touches me very deeply. Enterprise Award. Can you share a little bit on that chapter of the, uh, that journey? Well, uh, actually, there's nothing much to share except really that I think it's a very, we are very thankful for the recognition and more than anything, it's for the team. You know, it's just that we are representatives of the brand. But I think that for me, it came at a very, it came at a, it came at a time where I felt very encouraged that, you know, like, like, it was really something that, okay, awards are not something that we strive for. I mean, especially for, our, for, for us business people, I mean, it's not like, like Star Awards, where every year we hope to be best actress or best actress or top 10 most popular stuff like that. But I guess, of course, awards feel good, uh, but for us, more than anything, they are an assurance uh, and, 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 and re recognition for us. But it is not me. I really have an amazing team and it is, it is really for them, so yeah, I don't really have much to say. Yeah. Let's take one last question if you have time. Is there any last question? Right up there. Hi, Rachel. Thank you for the talk. Um, Hi. Hi. Two questions. First question. No, two questions. Cheating. Few, few questions. Uh, A few questions. <laughs> can I take a picture of you later? <laughs> Yes. Okay, cool. Okay. Second question, how do you differentiate your employee experience? Right? Uh, and third question, you're saying that you know growth at all costs is not the main goal of Le Bonito. What other kind of goals do you set for Le Bonito? Yeah, correct. So if, if revenue, bottom line, top line is not the sole goal of Love Bonito, what other goals do you set? I think for me, like for example, whenever we come up with marketing initiatives, and of course for us, we hope that there is great ROI returns from terms of sales, in terms of acquisition and stuff like that. But more than anything, the marketing team knows that if they don't do well, you know, my question to them will be, what is the experience the customer gets out of it. And I think like so many times it's more than just like, why is it that we never hit the top line? Why is it that we never hit a target? Yes, that is important and crucial as well. But at the end of the day, that is not what I'll hold them accountable to. I think so many times the initiatives that we come up with might not make sense on paper. Like starting workshops. You know, these are things that 
extra OT for me, for my team. Uh, I have to logistical extra money basically, extra cost. And the returns on paper is not something on the short term we can all see and agree with. But it is still something that the brand chooses to do because for me, it is planting and sowing seeds into my customer's life and it's something that I believe is the beginning of something bigger. So it's really more than just that. I think revenues and targets, monetary targets aside, the other thing is really the experience and what am I doing for my customers in the long run. Yeah, okay, have second question. How do I how do I differentiate my customer? Your employee experience. My employee experience. I have two employees here today. Can I get them to come and share? Maybe it's better. Okay, come, Jamie and Angie. Can you please give them a round of applause? I think they have worked with other companies before. Come on! The people I want to go home. <laughs> so maybe Jamie and Angie, they have been with me. Angie has been, Love Bonito is seven years old. Angie has been around for three years. That's almost half the life of Love Bonito and Jamie, two and a half years. So previously, you guys, I know Angie has worked for another company with me. Yes? Part time, okay. So the question the gentleman there has is how do you think Love Bonito differentiates our employee satis I mean, employee experience from the rest? Yeah, so how? <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say actually at Le Bonito, it's a very different experience as compared to what I experience out there in the world. In the world? In the world, yes. In the marketplace. Okay, it's, it feels like family. Every time we're there, we're there not because we love the work. I can say no matter what, you get burnt out and you feel like there are, there are days that you don't wish to go to work, but it's the people there that actually pushes you to continue doing what you do. It's the, it's the spirit that we have at Learn Bonito that's something different from what I've experienced out there. So if you ask me what's the experience I have at Learn Bonito or my employer, I would say it's the support and the care and like friendship that we have over there. Also at the same time, Rich actually feels more like a friend than a boss. You know, there's the difference between boss and leader. And to me, she's a leader that inspires me to be better and she's always very supportive in whatever I do and whatever ideas we have, no matter how frivolous or how dramatic it can be, she's always very supportive and she, lets, she gives us a creative freedom to do what we want to do. Uh, by the way, I'm from the creative team, so this freedom is actually very important to me. Yeah, So it's something that I don't get out there. That's why to me, Love Bonito is somewhere who is a place where I will stay for a very long time because it really grows me and it gives me a lot of exposure that I'm pretty sure I, for my age, it's something hard to get out to out in other other companies or in the marketplace. For myself, um, coming from uh, other other companies, uh, Love Bonito really is very different because it really feels like. Uh, we are we are all part of this uh, family, and I feel that um, going to work every day really has a purpose and has a meaning because of all the lives that that um, we get to touch together. And I really get to see how Rich is not someone who who um, like profit margin is not the most important thing to her because. <laughs> I price the items and sometimes, <laughs> many times she'll say, hey, Jimmy, this is too expensive, you need to, like, maintain. <laughs> and that's how we really get to see really her heart for um, her customers' uh, experience and um, for, for, for all uh, big things as well. And so really, it's really the, the uh, being, being able to, to go to work and it doesn't feel like work to all of us. It's really uh, working on a project together. Uh, and, and she's not like any other bosses. Nah. She's more like a friend. And, and uh, she's always really, really uh, encouraging. So that really matters to all of us as uh, millennials. Yeah. I think if I may add something, I think one of the key things as a leader to people and millennials is um, it. One of the reasons why I felt like I reached the end of myself 
And one of the reasons why I felt so overwhelmed that I, I just wanted to give up was because I felt that there was nothing more that I could give to them or my staff. I felt that I can't teach and impart any more than I have done. And so it was truly the burden of my heart to be able to hopefully bring someone in to be able to lead, guide, grow, inspire them in their work and you know help their development of their skills professionally and personally so that they can really grow as people. So I guess, yeah, for me that's really one of the burdens of my heart that the people have someone to learn from, grow from and, and just continues help push them to be better versions of themselves. And while I can in my aspects, I think there are certain aspects that I can't. So I think it's really important that we at least need to fill that gap for, for the staff. Yes.